physical abstraction rather than the reality of, of now. So the, <clears throat> the through the intuitive awareness, through awareness, sati sampatanya, then we can begin to 
embrace the present moment in a way that includes rather than defines or excludes or describes anything. And this, this is where the wisdom faculty develops, the panya, uh, being able to discern the born and the unborn. So like in, uh, in just uh, awareness then we, we know, you know, first we start with the unborn because that's with the born because that's what we're identified with, what we believe in, what we're conditioned to think is reality. Uh, you know, the sense of a self, I'm this person, this body, and, <clears throat> and uh, nationality and gender and all the rest. So we, we become, uh, you know, we, we are, this is our real world, is this world of the born and the created. And of course, all of that is, and you know, the Buddha keeps reiterating, Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. So then, like in a lot of teachings of Vipassana in the West, they, they emphasize, the, you know, this seeing the impermanence of conditioned phenomena. But uh, the unborn, uncreated, unformed, and conditioned generally ignored, uh, at least from my experience in, in the, in living in the UK. <clears throat> so, and yet this is the reality of now. It's unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. So you try to figure that out. You can't. Your, your thinking mind uh, can't deal with it because the thinking mind is so limited to conditioned phenomena, to the born, the created. So that's where this mindfulness is the uh, is the way, is the escape from from the born, the created, the form, the condition. If we we just try to rearrange the conditions and the forms and manipulate them, then we're caught in the whirlpool of, of change, which only leads to more suffering, disappointment, disillusionment. So the aim, you know, like our life here, Nana Cha, the it's been a Bhikkhu Samanera, or whatever, is to really uh, begin to uh, trust in the awareness of the moment, to begin to recognize the unborn, uncreated as the reality of now. It's Dhamma, it's not, it's not personal, it's not made up of things, it's, it's, you know, the things in this moment change according to other conditions. But, say, for example, your, your, uh, with separate beings in form, you know, so I'm sitting here, Ajahn Kim is there, so forth, and this is, this is the form and the condition, the names, the conventional realities that we, we use. But then the Paramatta uh, Satcha, or ultimate reality, includes all that. It doesn't, it doesn't define, but it's the ability to discern. Uh, we have to live in the, in the world of the born and the created, you know, the planet that we live on, the universe, the sun and moon, and uh, the solar system, and all that is the created, the born. Uh, but this, this special ability that the Buddha pointed to uh, of the deathless reality, the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned, and then when I Chanted Namotasa, then I chanted this Pali phrase, Aparita de Sangamatasa Tawara, which means something I always liked. Uh, one of the, the, the gate to the death list is open. Uh, trust in this and, and, and uh, give yourself to this, this, this reality, to the reality of here and now. So it's like an announcement to the world that. Uh, there is an escape from birth and death, from a conditioned world, from your own conditioned habits, your own fears, desires, emotional problems, memories, and and uh, prejudices, biases, attitudes, and whatnot. So it's uh, this uh, Ajahn Chah was, I found, you know, he was a teacher, an excellent wisdom, because he's always pointing at this, uh, and and uh, it's something you point at, you you know, like your life here as a, as a monk is to, 
is to, you know, not to become a monk and identify with seniority or position or, you know, cling to the idea of I'm a bhikkhu, but it's more just a convenient, expedient means for awareness, for giving, for confining our life more, making it more simple and less problematic, because lay life now is very complex and complicated. And uh, people are just very confused everywhere, you know, because of the, there's so many options and problems and <clears throat> difficulties uh, in every possible way, you know. So uh, here at Narata, you see, this is a rare opportunity to really uh, direct your attention in a way that, it, you know, this is the aim of this to support this mindfulness rather than to recondition you to kind of condition you into some kind of Buddhist samana as an identity. The, uh, over, you know, the many years that I've been a bhikkhu, I found it, you know, that's why I have a great respect for, for this tradition because I found it such a kind of accurate, uh, useful convention to investigate reality. And, uh, you know, not just to change it you know, to a Buddhist monk and, and adopting a monastic form, but to, to really see this, this, uh, the, the attachments we have, the, the desires, the tendencies, the habits, the, uh, uh, one personally has or experiences in this form of, of the body and the sense of identifying with the body and the personality as being me and mine. So in the Four Noble Truths teaching, actually the, the first two Noble Truths give you the clues, you know, the suffering and then the causes of suffering. And then as you, as you investigate the causes of suffering and you begin to notice it, not to judge it, not to take sides, not to observe, all that arises ceases, both, you know, it, as objects of your senses and and feelings and memories and conditions, emotions that you have in your in your own mind, uh, you begin to recognize like the Puto mantra, this, this awareness, this this uh, Puru style of the uh, forest tradition is, <laughs> I found very beneficial because there is a knowing, you know, we, we, you know, one is incarcerated in a form for a lifetime, so you have to deal with, with the problems of that, of this form, the body, and it, and then the karma, the conditioning process that one received after birth, you know, to the cultural, social identities that education and so forth that we acquire <clears throat> and then the aim of the Buddhist teaching is to develop, to return to this awareness, pure awareness, pure conscious awareness uh, before you impose anything into it and it's empty you know it's not, it isn't annihilating anything but it, there's no sense of grasping or in that emptiness you begin to discern uh, the difference. You discern grasping desires are like this, non-grasping is like this. So then you, you know, you can see for yourself that non-grasping is, uh, there's no suffering. When I start grasping things out of desire and ignorance, then I, I get caught, you know, in the tendencies I have as a conditioned personality to, to make problems out of little things or to be caught in fear and self-consciousness and guilt and remorse and, and all those emotions that, um, you know, one that are generated out of this conditioning, uh, with this blind conditioning that you receive after you're born. Like when a baby's born, it, it has a form, human form, human form and it's conscious, but it doesn't, it isn't a person yet, it doesn't have a language. It doesn't have an identity, either with its body as being male or female, or being uh, Thai or English or whatever. It's just, it's just pure conscious awareness, 
it, and it, it has a instinctual intelligence like the, to survive and it, it's, uh, that kind of uh, survival mechanism operates right from the, the first moment but then is where you know as we grow older we're influenced by what our mother thinks and says and father and the social group we are we are in and uh, nationality and then, then we we develop a sense of separate identity and self and so that's that's the biggest uh, the greatest obstruction is that uh, Sanyojana the first one Sakaya Viti because it's so uh, kind of insidious it just kind of holds you in, into believing everything you're thinking or feeling and so this see, see, you know this uh, mindfulness then allows us to observe the feeling the emotions the conditioning that we experience that arises when certain other conditions create that opportunity. So, uh, and as you, you know, through the years of uh, practice, then, you know, you keep cultivating this, this, uh, this awareness in your life. So it integrates well into, into um, life as, you know, I've had to, you know, I've been caught into positions of establishing monasteries now for most of my monastic life, and the, and the uh, uh, you know, being a head monk and so forth, and and uh, taking on all these duties, you know, could be an obstruction because if if one identifies with position, then it, it you know then you really can't survive as a, as a personality uh, but you can through this awareness and this is what uh, you know Lopacha emphasized that, that this, is, this has to be the priority this awareness and, and begin to recognize and trust it like the third noble truth is actually the, the insight into the cessation of conditioned phenomena and when conditioned phenomena ceases, you know, in your in consciousness, then there's there's the unborn. What's left is unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. And you can discern that. You can know that. It's not it's not an abstract philosophical idea. It's reality. It's it's real. It's the ultimate reality. And this is this is the. Uh, the gift of our human birth is that we have this occasion to to know this. We're not just helpless victims of our karma, like you know, like the animal world tends to be caught in its karmic forms. You know, so it can't reflect on its own existence or on the it can't discern the unborn, uncreated. But it, so it operates according to. Uh, its species, its, its instinctual tendencies and the forms of the various creatures that exist. <clears throat> and then we have an animal form, so we're not that much different physically from a chimpanzee. But, uh, but uh, I don't know if chimpanzees can reflect, but human beings can, and this of course is, is the the uh, the the uh, essence of the Buddha's teaching, its emphasis on mindfulness, is uh, because this is the escape hatch from ignorance and suffering. So it's uh, this is uh, this you know is a teaching that is an ancient teaching. It's not like modern New Age philosophy or psychology. So it, it comes from, you know, the ancient time in India. So it's uh, it's not something new. And that's what, you know, you know, somebody like myself, an American brought up in the in the kind of attitudes of history. I was I majored in history at university and and thinking of ancient times and modern times. And also you know, in the West, sometimes they say, "Well, Buddhism is an 
ancient teaching appropriated for people in India 2,500 years ago. But what has it to offer, the, you know, modern people in a modern society? But it, it is uh, impressive to see how eager people are in, in countries like the United Kingdom or European countries or the States, Australia, how eager they are to to hear this kind of teaching and to be able to have some kind of opportunity to practice it. The monastic form is, is probably the, because it is, is a traditional form, so it it's, uh, keeps the, the teaching from disappearing because this kind of teaching, you know, uh, it would disappear immediately after the enlightened being died. You know, if it didn't, if the Buddha hadn't established a Vinaya, uh, we wouldn't know anything about the Buddha. <laughs> it probably he would have been a memory or worshipped him as some kind of deity of some sort. But because he did establish uh, the Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, and these, then this is this is uh, this is his first sermon after enlightenment. It's, it's a teaching that. I think, you know, I see it as really perfect in itself. It's, it has everything in it you need to know for liberation. But it's a matter of applying it. It's not just understanding it or questioning or arguing about the meaning of this word or that word or various interpretations, but it's actually, you know, suffering isn't some abstract, rare experience is the ordinary, banal experience of most of us, uh, all of us, really, in, in in daily life. And so we experience Dukkha in Wat Nana Chat and, and anywhere else, in Bangkok or within this uh, paradisical resort in Phuket the past week. <laughs> <laughs> And it was as close to heaven as I've ever been, but <laughs> <laughs> I could still see it. It wasn't an escape from suffering. <laughs> and then uh, the escape from suffering is always in the in the jitta in the mind. So, like like the, the I tell the story when I was uh, before I went to England. It was 1977, I think. I went to live in the UK in 1977. So it was, uh, before I went there, I went to see Lung Pu Kao in Udon. Because I always had a great admiration for him. He was one of the disciples of uh, Lung Pu Man. So, and he was very old at the time, so I went to his monastery in Udon and and I just, I just wanted to pay respect to him. I didn't want to, you know, like bother him or because he, he's very old and and he wasn't out in public uh, uh, place, you know, he was in his his room. So the monk that was uh, serving him was, uh, told me to go in the room, and I thought, no, 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 I don't want to. This is very English, even before. <laughs> don't want to be a nuisance, don't want to uh, bother him. And, and, and the monk insisted I go in the room. And so I, I opened the door and it was quite dark in the room and there was this body lying down, looked like a corpse. And I crawled in on my hands and knees and and uh, and then uh, Lumpu uh, turned and looked at me and these these very bright eyes glowing eyes. His body looked like a shriveled corpse, yeah, but his eyes were, were radiant, and so I I told him that uh, I'd be leaving Thailand and going to live in, in England, so he, you know, was very pleased to hear that and, and gave me his blessing. But the reason why I always uh, admired him, because after the first or second bathroom, at Wat Ba Pong, Lung Po Cha, I think it was a, the second, but the first class, and Lung Po Cha took Tanajan Baha Mon and I on a trip, and uh, we went to visit these Ajahns, like Lung Phu Phan in, in uh, Sokol Nakhon, and 
ลงตาบัวอันอาจารย์เขาอันสโตฟอร์ตอันวีอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอันอเขาเทปนั่นเขาจะได้พวกมันพูดอะไรสิ่งที่ดีๆแล้วเขาเทปมันและเขาจะไม่สามารถอ่านอะไรพวกเขาพูดแต่ฉันอยู่ในระยะเวลาแล้วเมื่อเขาพูดแล้วเขาก็ไปและเขาก็ไปแล้วเขาก็ไปแล้วเขาก็ไปแล้วเขาก็ไปแล้วเขาก็ไปแล้วเขา Um, he was uh, sitting in a wheelchair, and he he beckoned to me to come, and so uh, he gave me this this sermon, a very uh, you know sermon that I've never forgotten. Even it's very simple, and even I can understand it in the limited time that I had at that time. And that was uh, it's here, reality is here. Do jit, do die, and so. That because it's coming from obviously a very wise uh, master, you know. Even though that can sound rather, you know, meaningless, or you know, you hear it all the time. Just watch your mind on uh, reflections. But because of the significant circumstances that that I was experiencing, it it really uh, meant a lot. And of course, that's what the, the teaching really is. It's a, It's, it's to really uh, see that it's a matter of this awareness of observing rather than becoming anything or trying to to get rid of things and struggle with with negativity or lust or things like this and to to try to get rid of them and try to become something that you know like the way we interpret scriptures oftentimes is from a very attaining mind like becoming attaining. Stream entry, or attaining our hardship, or attaining something we don't have, and so this this approach of attainment I found very uh, deluding because I'm from a very attaining culture, goal-oriented, competitive society, and so I, you know, in here in Nana Na Chat, when I was when we first established this place, I I changed from From you know, fight with your calaces, kill your calaces to observe them, because this is Puru, this this Puto mantra reminds you of of just being the observer, not the critic, not the judge, but the observer. And then the form that you're in is a Liku, is a, you know it's a it's a expedient vehicle for living as a human being in this at this time. So it's It simplifies. It it uh, makes our choices less. You know, we have to give up all kinds of things. We have to go against our own habit tendencies, uh, and it gives us boundaries to to run run into, to to resist or fight. But as we begin to, you know, the aim of the vina is not just to to kind of conform to it in a resigned, passive way, but to actually use it for mindfulness. So you're actually observing your own stubbornness, rebelliousness, uh, resentment, as you you're living here in in a n a c h a the way that one's emotional reactions are ignited through restraint and restriction and and through limitation on action and speech. So I want to offer this as a reflection. And encourage you in every way to uh, to to you know really appreciate opportunity that you have here to to really cultivate this path in a in a very practical, realistic way.